I am super excited, I have to say, about our next fireside chat. The Great Connector, how music app Treble is driving user engagement and brand interaction. Uh, joining me on uh, today's uh, fireside chat is Corey Jones, the co-founder and head of music engagement at Treble, a music app that's breaking barriers and bringing free streaming to users all over the world. Corey, how are you doing today? I am great. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's uh, good to be chatting. Yeah. And, you know, one of the um, uh, one of the things that I think was, um, you know, really amazing about your your company as a, it's sort of beyond being an active user of, of your product um, uh, was when when I started to sort of like look at your growth numbers um, and I was, you know, super, um, uh, super impressed by them. I think you're up to at this point, 3.5 million active users. Um, I think you guys have pulled that off in eight or uh, less quarters. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of companies and I, and I see a lot of different apps out there. We're really one of the most impressive stories I've seen in, in a long time. Would, would love for you uh, to give us a little bit of um, a background on, you know, what's fueling that growth and um, uh, where you're headed from here. Sure. I'm happy to dive into it. I, I will say that we are in the middle of a, of a public fundraising process. So uh, there are some things I can and cannot say, but, but I'll do my best here. So uh, to answer your question, um, look, you have to understand what it is that we do as a product, but really understand it within the context of what is happening in the music industry and the timing around that and really what the opportunity is. So, so let's start there. Um, it, when people talk about the things that, that make, a, make a startup successful, they mention a few factors, timing, team, fundraising, business model. And I think the timing for us is really in our favor. Um, at, at, a, at a basic level, the way to think about Treble is we are an investor-owned music service that caters to billions of people that want to play their music without an internet connection or with an internet connection for free. Um, and the reason that's important is when you think about why people pay for music right now, why they might subscribe to music. The, the two factors that, that, that matter most to, to, to individuals are, number one, the ability to, to play music on demand, as opposed to, you know, you don't, you don't subscribe, you get a free tier, it's more like radio. Um, but in many parts of the world, too, uh, the need to play it offline is important because you have expensive data plans and things of that nature. Um, we are actually the only music service in the world that is licensed by the major labels uh, to offer unlimited free downloads um, through a business model that is unlike a subscription. Goldman is predicting that in by 2023, we're going to have 690 million or so uh, premium subscribers, which is great. That's, a, that's one market. Um, what, what is missing from that equation that is never really discussed is the fact that there's going to be 5 billion smartphones on the planet, okay, uh, at that point in time. So, so what are the other 4.5 billion people doing to access music? Um, and, and we're looking at this from the angle of as, subscription, um, as the subscription market matures, um, we, we have a model that we think can cater to the, to the masses in the same way that Facebook and YouTube and, and TikTok have never really gone through the subscription route. That's what we're doing with music. I think it's really interesting when you look at those, at those stats that Goldman um, has put out. Um, the growth in the, in the marketplace is, is really um, going, to be, um, going to be huge as you, um, as you sort of go down the path. Um, you know, for, um, uh, for sort of our audience here, um, maybe we can dive in uh, a little bit into uh, segmentation. You asked about segmentation, and, and that can cut many different ways, and it certainly does in our, our business. Um, I can tell you right now, at the highest level, when we segment our users, we, we sort of think of them in three different buckets. Uh, number one is the user that, so, uh, th there's a lot of subscription fatigue happening right now in the world. Uh, you know, there was a survey I looked at the other day, it said 40% of of Americans are frustrated by the number of media subscriptions they can't keep track and so forth. And so I think people are starting to uh, to look for alternatives to that. That's one group of users that, that we cater to. The other the other group, uh, the second segment I should say, is the the category of users that can pay for music but really don't see the value. 
Um, and then the third category is the people that simply can't pay because of uh, income factors and so forth. And when you dive deep into um, really the demographic profiles of these users, in our case, let's take the first bucket, people that uh, the, are, are subscribing to many services right now, they tend to be older, right? And what we have found is that when we're targeting those users and we're uh, when we put out new music every Friday, because these people are older, they, they tend to gravitate less towards the new music. And so the question that we then have to answer is, how can we take advantage to uh, of, our, of our catalog uh, releases um, to really create experiences for these users? And I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things, this is super recent, um, but one of the things we started uh, marketing heavily um, th th these past few weeks in the app is certified diamond albums. So we have a whole section and we find that when we test that container of releases versus say, um, uh, you know, top 40 hits or, or greatest hits by um, artists from the 80s and so forth, it performs really well. So it's, it's a constant process of testing, but with that specific group of users, um, it, it's, it's a certain type of content that will resonate versus say, the uh, lower income group, which tends to be younger, they will gravitate towards a TikTok playlist. The, um, we have a horoscope type playlist. If you're an Aquarius, this is what they say you should like. And it, it's a constant process of trial and error, but we, 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 we sort of find what resonates uh, through experimentation with those different uh, uh, buckets of users. Hey, it's funny, I, um, I know this, I am an actual Aquarius. And, um, and and I'm wondering if uh, Metallica would be on my playlist at, at, at all. Um, and ha by, the, by the way, I'm sort of curious, like what kind of bands are showing up or uh, in certified diamond albums? Oh gosh, um, off the top of my head, I can tell you Britney Spears is in there. I think it was Oops, I Did It Again. Uh, and, and her first one, the one prior to that. Um, there's a Nickelback album that I know was put in there. Cree, there's a lot of stuff from the 90s. Um, I mean, you can imagine the NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, and if you go even further back in time, Michael Jackson, uh, some older releases. But that's what that's what's uh, uh, showing up right now. It's it's funny. Um, I, she she won't remember me, but I I went to um, university with Gwen Stefani, and oh, wow. um, this is uh, back in um, the early in the ska music days. So the uh, the, the oh, early yeah. days of um, of No Doubt. And um, uh, so, uh, no doubt, I uh, actually used to play our college quad um, okay. <laughs> at, 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 at school and in front of like less than a hundred people. Um, oh, uh, that's with, fantastic! That, now you're talking my, my kind of music, the 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 nineties quad yeah. and, and punk. Yeah, 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 it. yeah. It was it was great stuff. Um, from a sort of a, I guess um, a, a competitor standpoint. Um, how do you guys sort of um, uh, sort of view the marketplace, you know, competitively, um, and and then how do you make sort of adjustments um, to create better engagement? I, I know it's sort of a big question, um, but you've got all these other competitors out of the marketplace. Everybody's sort of doing something different. Um, you know, what's really helping you guys um, grow fast? I guess. Sure. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There are a lot of music services out there um, that we think of as competitors, but there's one category that I don't think is entirely obvious that is probably the biggest. And this is where uh, when we look to what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, react to what others are doing? This, this, is, this is the category that we look at. Uh, in, in fact, to explain it, what I would do is I would encourage everybody that's, that's listening out there, go, go to Google and type in two terms, YouTube and MP3, okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to produce 8 billion results uh, that are all linking to websites that allow uh, individuals across the globe to turn YouTube uh, videos into an MP3 file with one click. Okay, that is the new form of, 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 of piracy and illegal activity. And what, what, what the generation now is doing, uh, specifically in markets like, like Latin America um, and parts of Southeast Asia, and even in the United States to a large extent, they will uh, rip a lot of these music videos, turn them into MP3s, and then import them into apps on the Google Play Store and in the App Store that masquerade as players, just music players, right? Um, in Mexico in particular, where we do have a large presence, uh, again, not a lot of people know this, uh, seven out of the top 10 apps in the free music category in the Google Play Store 
are of this variety. They are just simply players that will allow you to play your own ripped content. And the to your question about how does that really inform how how we engage users, um, you would think that uh, that an obvious step is to look at a service like an Apple Music or, or Spotify. But I'll tell you one thing that that we're focusing on right now is that when when we get an individual into our app, the very first thing that we are focused on right now is getting them to import their own music. Because what we find is that that reduces the need to initially to initially like try to uh, uh, personalize content for them because they're importing libraries um, that they already have, it's music that they already know that they like. Um, and then we start to recommend content. We build off of that. That's not something that you do in a lot of the more mainstream services um, but there's a reason that a lot of these apps that, that are competitors, competitors are um, sort of below the radar, and we, we take a cue from them um, in, in, in that sense um, when we did like some benchmarking analysis and, and so forth. That's interesting. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you look at um, uh, sort of um, uh, user lifecycle um, uh, marketing at this point? Good question. Uh, there's look you can you can read blogs about this all day long there are a million out there and and they go into detail about you should do this you should do that uh i, I have found that if you break it down into five simple steps and i'm sure there's a, a, a proper frame for framework for this somewhere um it, it's the picture becomes much more clear in terms of what you need to do uh, number one we think of it in five stages uh the first stage is you acquire a user how do you get them to register Okay, so so that, that's step number one, and that's a process uh, on its own. Step number two is figure out the action, the the first action or two that you're trying to um, to drive. How can you get the user to perform that action once? That's the second step. Step number three is how can you get them to perform perform it repetitively, and and that can be twice, three times, four times, five times. And then the fourth step is really create, that's when you're looking at month two, three, four retention, is how can you create long-term loyalty? For example, in our service, the user builds up a library of 100 songs, and it's sort of that diminishing returns thing. It becomes uh, a little bit, you know, th they knew the first 100 songs. It was easy to recommend a lot of things, but getting them to discover that 101th or 102 song is, 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 becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And then number five is just reactivating dormant users. And so within each of those steps, um, there are very specific things that we we are constantly optimizing, A-B tests using push notifications, in-app notifications to try to drive those behaviors. For example, one being um, how can we get users to import their library, which, by the way, um, literally in the past uh, two weeks, we've doubled that metric um, using the, the Clever Tap tool. So That's awesome. That, that's awesome. Um uh, one um uh, one 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 question I had for you was sort of around um how you're um uh, how you're working on um incorporating um advertisers and and brands um in into the uh, into the mix as well and and you know sort of how they perceive um how you're able to drive real value um uh, for uh, for those brands it's um, in businesses like yours um you know those things certainly become really uh, really important. Uh, it, it, it sounds like you guys are, are doing a fantastic job making things sticky um, for 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 users, which I'm sure is attracting uh, a lot of uh, a lot of brands out there. Uh, maybe you can uh, uh, give us a little bit of um, uh, info on that part of it. Sure, sure. I, I get that question a lot. It, it tends to come earlier in the conversation when we mentioned that we're offering a free service to users. Well, how do you pay for everything? Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. It's it's um, it's it's pretty unique to our business model. And so uh, what what we know is fact is that brands, there's probably three or four categories that they will always gravitate towards. You got sports, just pop culture and entertainment and music is, is, is one of those things. Um, the example I like to use without without naming names um, is we are doing business right now with a very large global retailer. Their biggest competitor is Amazon. Amazon has a lot of information on, on their customers. Um, this particular retailer does not. And the reason is that um, outside of the U.S. and to some extent in the U.S., um, most of the transactions that occur in store for them have, are, are cash transactions. And so it's, it's really hard to target your users and, and learn about them to, to really get them back in the store and, and recommend products when you have no information. 
So they came to us. They said, "Look, um, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. We need we need we need data." Um, and we said, "Okay." So we developed what is essentially a a. Uh, I guess you could think of it as a premium tier of our product. It's uh, minimal ads. Um, and the only way to access that product is to download our app and through a scanner inside of our app, as you're checking out, you have to scan your receipt with our app and then you get the premium version of the product uh, for seven to 14 days, which then hooks the user longer term, right? And so and, 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 so it's a win-win. The customer gets a, gets a great product. The brand now has has more data, um, and so what is it, what it essentially amounts to is a brand subsidizing or, or straight paying for a premium music experience in, in a win-win situation for all three parties. So it's things like this that we're doing. Um, I can't really speak to to all the specifics, but it, I, I will say that we anticipate if, if all goes well by Q4, you will uh, you will have heard of of this relationship. <laughs> Uh, you know, the relationship that you have with the music industry and the labels and um, uh, has to be an extraordinarily important part of, of what you do. And it also, I think, really validates your, um, your business in a way maybe some of the other, uh, the other companies don't have. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah. Uh, so as far as the, uh, our relationship with the music industry goes, it's, it's very strong. Um, one of the things that we did that you don't you don't seem to find a lot these days is since the inception of the company, we actually made it a point to go to the labels, explain our business model, and try to get licenses as opposed to going out, get you know, uh, stealing the music, and then going to the label saying, you know, please forgive us, let's do a deal now that we have 100 million users. Um, but but the reality is that the music industry is looking for new models. Um, I had mentioned the sub subscription growth. Um, it's going to continue to grow, but the, I think the pace of growth is going to decline. And so it's sort of uh, we sort of view what we're doing as the next frontier of a, of a pure play uh, music service. Some breaking news here: um, uh, the new president of the company, as of three weeks ago, is a gentleman named Vinny Frieda, who was formerly the chief data officer at Warner Music Group uh, globally. And so um, when you have somebody coming from a uh, a large I mean, one of the largest record labels in the world um, to join a small startup. Uh, you know, I think it speaks to the to what he sees that we're doing, and I and I expect that uh, you will see more more of that type of activity uh, from an HR perspective uh, happen going forward. But it's a strong relationship that we have with um, with the labels and the publishers and even the artists. Uh, I'm just going to hit you with um, just just one more um, uh, question on our way out. You know, what's sort of your your golden rule of um, uh, you know customer re retention? I would say um, don't try to be everything to everybody. Uh, one, I forget who popularized this uh, this chart or this metric, but one of the things that um, that I've learned over the last uh, several years that. Um, that I like to look at is it's, it's what's called a power user curve. And essentially on the y-axis, you have the percentage of users. And then on the x-axis, you have the number of days uh, that those users are using, uh, that your MAUs are using on average, uh, your app in a month. And typically what, what you want to see is sort of a smiley face. Uh, and what that would indicate is that you have some users that come in, they might use your app one day a month, sort of the looky lose. every app has that. But what, what we want to see is what does the, the right end of that curve look like? And the reason I bring this up is because if you can identify who those users are and what is the activity, what is their profile, what is, you know, if somebody might come in to our app, for example, there are four types of content we can, we can deliver, music videos, podcasts, downloaded music in your own library. Is it the case that... Uh, somebody that watches a music video is much more likely to come back and watch another music video or should we be focusing on the podcast and is it that is it that activity that, that really drives the right end of the curve so i think if you can hone in on what that is and and not try to appeal to every single type of user um you'll find that uh it's much easier to really optimize drive retention longer term by by um being the go-to service for for one type of uh, uh user at the end of the day, um, you need to build your own KPIs that are that are right, right. for your business, and you ultimately need to understand um, your uh, your users and uh, your users' behavior. 
I think, in, in order uh, to be effective. But um, Corey, uh, Corey, I want to thank you so much for uh, being on the um, uh, fireside chat today. Any uh, last words of wisdom you want to leave the uh, leave the group with? Uh, I want to make one shameless plug. You know, we're obviously excited about what we're doing. We're growing fast. Uh, we are raising money through a vehicle called Regulation A+. And if uh, you're interested in learning more or, or investing yourself, uh, what Reg A does is it allows, uh, it's part of the 2012 Jobs Act, but now an everyday investor can invest in uh, fast-growing private startups. This never used to be the case. Um, so if you are interested in investing or learning more, you can um, go to invest.treble.io. Uh, I will shameless plug for you. Um, uh, if, if you haven't uh, had a chance to uh, download Treble yet, I, um, I highly recommend uh, that the uh, audience out there uh, does that. Uh, for um, uh, Corey Jones, I'm Dave Dubois. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on today's um, Fireside Chat. Now, do me a favor and definitely stay tuned to learn more about some upcoming product announcements and features that will allow you to extract more value for your business and your users utilizing some popular and widely used channels in the marketer's toolbox. Mm -hmm.